sense of knowledge organized to do a task has always played a major role in economic and social activity. Indeed, the material levels of living, the character of social and cultural life, and the security of societies have always been closely related to the technologies they used. But the occurrence of the Industrial Revolution, first in Britain, it spread to other parts of Europe then the United States of America, Japan and Russia has led to technology coming to occupy center stage in the development of nations. Why does technology need to be acquired? Technology is an important determinant of corporate and business performance. An important question that now arises is how to acquire technology and from where. A country or an organization does not generate on its own or within the country alone all the technologies that are needed. It depends for many technologies on sources outside the country. Even industrially advanced countries continue to be significant importers of technology. Considering that technology imports become inescapable in certain cases, it is the endeavor of every technology acquirer to acquire the same optimally. The technology acquisition process is a complex one. It is very desirable that every acquirer is well sensitized to the many complex issues involved in the process and that he is fully aware of the pitfalls in the negotiation process for the purchase of technology and is able to identify strategies in the negotiations of the contract of technology purchase and a number of other issues. The process does not end by merely acquiring the technology, but much more is required to be done in terms of absorption and further development. What were the features of technology acquisition in our country during the early years after independence? The international scene at the time, namely the 50s, when the first group of European countries, Indonesia, India, China, Egypt, launched on the great ascent to improve the levels of living of their people, was one in which the highly industrialized countries started providing developing countries what has since come to be called economic aid and technical assistance. With economists calling for such transfer of resources from the rich countries to the poor ones, the process of acquisition of industrial technology also came to be called court transfer of technology, unquote. With the developing countries having little or no industrial infrastructure, let alone industrial productive capacity, the first transfers of technology took the form of the supply of complete factories and industrial plants by a northern country or a highly industrialized country to a southern or developing country. The actual actors involved in the process of transfer at the working level were a commercial enterprise in a highly industrialized country and a commercial enterprise in a developing country. Typically, a cement plant or a chemical plant was transferred by a supplier sending the production equipment to the developing country, installing and commissioning it, and then training technical personnel of the purchaser to operate and maintain the plant. The skill formation component was realized by supplying the requisite knowledge through technical documents, often called know-how, 
and through hands-on training both of the supplier's own plant and of the purchaser's new plant, often called show-how. However, in some cases, local skills to even operate and maintain the plant were not available in either the requisite quantity or quality. In such cases, the supplier's technical personnel themselves operated and maintained the plant for quite some time before local technical personnel were able to take over the plant. Such cases came to be called turnkey transfers of technology, as the supposition was that all that the purchaser had to do was to turn the key and the plant would start and operate. He had very little to do himself except provide local logistical and infrastructural support. All the early mining, power, steel and chemical plants in this country, which came up during the late 50s and up to the mid 60s, were set up with technology transfer undertaken on this basis. The same was the case in other large developing countries like China, Indonesia and Egypt. As experience was gained with operating and maintaining industrial plants, as we built up our secondary and tertiary educational systems and started producing personnel with knowledge of modern science and technology, and getting those personnel trained in the plants of the turnkey or near turnkey plant suppliers in both Western countries and the Comic Con or East European and Social Soviet Union, and as we built up the network of R&D laboratories and engineering design companies which we were fortunate to have set up through the vision and dedication first of Jawaharlal Nehru and then of Indira Gandhi and above all as we built up our capital goods producing industries, our machine building industries, we came to realize and appreciate several technical, commercial and contractual realities of industrial technology. The first and most fundamental thing we learnt was that technologies in general and industrial technologies in particular constituted commercial commodities carrying costs and prices. Therefore, their supply by one party to another constituted a commercial transaction. Hence, one should really speak of, quote, technology transaction, unquote, rather than technology transfer. There are no free lunches in the realm of technology any more than in any other area of commerce. What are the characteristics and implications of the technology market? The appreciation I have summarized above led in turn to a recognition that there was an international market for technology like for any other transacted commodity. However, this market, the experience of many developing countries indicated, differed significantly from the market for agricultural commodities or minerals or manufactured products, whether consumer goods or capital goods. Indeed, it was found that the technology market was unique in several ways. First, there are no standard prices for know-how packages, unlike for, say, cement or tractors. The price at which a technology can be bought depended much more heavily on the degree of competition that was available or could be generated by a buyer than in the case of normal or conventional goods. Secondly, the information of all types, for example, on the number and quality of alternative suppliers, on their respective financial position of those suppliers, at the time a technology purchase was being contemplated, of the track record of performance of similar technology transactions undertaken by those companies in other countries, or with other buyers in the past, all these had profound effects on the buyer's options, on his negotiating leverage, and on the price and other terms of the final technology purchase. However, we also came to appreciate that such information was extremely hard to come by, largely because it was kept as secret as possible by the technology sellers. Thirdly, that sellers tried to impose numerous restrictive conditions in the agreements covering technology transactions, restrictions relating to the buyer purchasing capital goods or components and parts 
only from or through the seller. This normally meant that the seller was able to charge much more than the open market price for these inputs. Secondly, export restrictions by way of demanding a minimum quantum of royalty irrespective of the volume of sales by the buyer. Restrictions even on the buyer modifying or improving the technology purchased. Restrictions relating to patents and other forms of intellectual property as also use of brand names of the product of the technology seller and many others. There were in addition many restrictive provisions relating to taxation, legal rights and obligations of the buyer, laws and adjudicatory bodies under which disputes between the buyer and the seller would be settled, etc. Fourthly, buyers also found that the seller often palmed off on them obsolete technologies, which the seller himself was in the process of discontinuing use of in his own plant because he had developed a newer, more efficient technology. This resulted in the cost, quality and other characteristics of the product to be made by the technology buyer using the foreign technology purchased being much worse than those of the seller right from the time the technology was purchased. Apart from being deleterious to the domestic economy of the buyer, the obsolescence of this kind tended to build non-competitiveness in the international market into the production structure of the buyer right from the beginning of the technology relationship, thereby seriously affecting the export performance of industrial companies in developing countries. What are the components of a technology package? By the early 1970s, studies and actual experience of the content of technology transferred revealed that industrial technology was not a quote black box unquote, that it had a structure with a number of constituent elements, the most important of which were documented knowledge, which I shall use the shorthand DK for, skills, S, hardware or capital goods and production machinery, or H. Experience showed that technology was partly in the form of technical knowledge set out in documentation, partly embodied in hardware, that is production machinery or capital goods, and partly embodied in human skills. While documented knowledge, often loosely termed know-how, was often regarded as the core of the technology, operationally it was meaningless to speak of transfer of technology without dealing with the other two main elements of the technology package, namely the hardware and the skills. The relative proportions of these three components of the total technology package vary widely from technology to technology, i.e. from production process to production process. They also vary in the same production process over time due to the demands of the market, to the relative costs of labor and capital, and hence the nature and direction of technical change, product sophistication, customer needs, etc. Defining the composition of the technology package in this way, enabling what we call unbundling of the technology package into its main elements. This in turn enables one to see the range of possible mixes of imported and domestic elements of the package. This is shown in the first graphic. I would like to emphasize that the range of matrices shown in the first graphic do not imply that reaching the situation where the skill base, the documented knowledge and the hardware are all supplied domestically in all products of a particular company let alone in all companies in an industrial sector must necessarily be the goal of technology strategy, whether at the national, sectoral or enterprise levels. Which mix in the matrix should be adopted depends on a number of factors. What are the forms and features of technology acquisition? 
Whichever way we go, a key element of the total process of identifying, selecting, negotiating, acquiring and implementing a foreign technology is to ensure that the process provides both technically and contractually for the ob effective absorption, adaptation and improvement of the purchase technology by the Indian company buying the foreign technology involved. The central element of this issue is the realization that the purchase technology, though initially meant for production, can and should concurrently be made the input into a local R&D effort aimed at absorbing, adapting and improving the original technology and putting that improved technology into production as soon as possible in the plant of the Indian company. How such absorption, adaptation and improvement can be done is indicated in the following graphics that will be shown. This graphic portrays what I call adaptive transfer. Here the first generation technology purchased by our company from a foreign company, FT, at time T1 is introduced not directly into the production plant of the Indian company but into the R&D in-house department or center of the Indian company, supplemented where needed with R&D inputs from external R&D laboratories and design engineering companies. The objective of the task undertaken there is adaptation of the foreign technology to our raw materials, industrial standards, scales of production, etc. Only after such adaptation is the foreign technology introduced into a production at time T2. This graphic depicts full transfer. Here foreign technology FT purchased at time T1 is simultaneously introduced into the production system P and into the R&D unit. The objective is that by the time Tn, i.e. some years later, when the imported technology becomes obsolescent, the R&D unit should be in a position to offer the Indian company an Indian technology, IT, which is an improved version of the foreign technology originally imported, leading to production based on the foreign technology of the next generation called P2. This graphic shows full adaptive transfer, which is basically a combination of the earlier two mechanisms. Finally, we have what I call pseudo or passive transfer, in which there is no interaction at all between the imported technology and the local R&D unit. It's a matter of great regret that the bulk of the foreign technology transfers that have taken place in our country have been passive transfers. As a result, with some important exceptions, our companies have resorted to repeated foreign technology acquisition agreements for the same or similar product. However, such an approach is basically futile because every time what the foreign technology supplier sells to the Indian company is his older technology, not his latest or up-to-date technology. So obsolescence tends to get built into our companies and indeed into whole sectors of our industry. We must recognize that no foreign technology supplier is going to sell our companies his latest technology and create a potential competitor for himself in the world market, even if that were to happen only in the future. This is why the Japanese have for a long time been investing four to five times the money is paid by them to the foreign technology supplier on their own in-house R&D to absorb and improve the purchased technology. This has led them to transform their companies first from buyers of technology to self-generators of technology and then into technology exporters. If we really intend to build up a globally competitive industry, Therefore, such concurrent R&D has to become an essential, indeed a central element of foreign technology acquisition. 
I come now to some issues relating to the strategy and management of technology acquisition. Against the background of the issues presented so far, that our companies have to approach the acquisition of foreign technology to make any product. The first requirement for doing so successfully is to design an integrated strategy for the whole process on a long-term basis. So this strategy has to cover at least the following elements. Firstly, identifying as wide a range of potential foreign technology suppliers as possible for the product to be made. Secondly, shortlisting from that range those foreign companies who are most likely to be responsive to concluding a techno-commercially viable technology transfer contract. Thirdly, acquiring enough techno-commercial information from all the shortlisted potential technology suppliers to assess which of the products involved best suits our market and customer needs. Then we have to obtain technology transfer offers broken down into documented knowledge or know-how, capital goods and skill formation components as discussed earlier for the capacity of the production plan proposed to be set up here. Thereafter, seeing that such offers also include as much technical cost and source of supply information as possible on the components and parts going into the product to be made if it is an equipment and raw materials and intermediates if it is a chemical or other process-based product has to be undertaken. Using the above inputs to arrive at the magnitudes of project cost and cost of production. Concurrently, we have to obtain from all potential foreign technology suppliers commitments in regard to support to the Indian company for absorption, adaptation and improvement, however reluctant the foreign company may be to do so. Wherever possible, this should include provisions for work by the Indian company's R&D personnel in the R&D division of the foreign technology supplier. We then have to ensure that the technology payments by way of lump sum fee and royalty also include compensation to the foreign technology supplier for the rights of our company to use any patents which the foreign company may have taken out in India relating to the technology being purchased, i.e. no additional payments for such patent rights should be involved. These are only some of the major elements of the overall strategy. Many more detailed elements of operational nature are also involved. However, the key issue for the Indian company is to obtain offers for technology sale from as many foreign companies as possible and then play one foreign company off against the other to secure the best possible technical, financial and contractual terms of technology purchase. While doing so, I would emphasize the need for our companies to be aware that lump sum know-how fees, engineering fees, royalties and the like are only the explicit technology payments involved. Indeed, they are the tip of the iceberg. The rest of the iceberg consists of payments for such elements of the technology package as proprietary capital goods that the plant may involve, imported components and parts in the case of product technology and raw materials and intermediates in the case of process technology and payments for the foreign technology supplier sending his engineers to commission and or start up our company's plant. These implicit or partly hidden payments for foreign technology are often much more than the explicit payments. So they need to be the prime targets of the negotiating process. I come now to the technology transfer contract itself. The commitments and rights and obligations of both the technology supplier and the buyer have now to be incorporated in a technology transfer contract often called the technology licensing agreement. 
I will not go into the details of this document. All I would like to say is that there is a whole body of skills and knowledge needed to structure and negotiate such contracts. And tapping the relatively few sources in the country, having that knowledge base and skill base should be an important task of our entrepreneurs. All the various components of the technology acquisition process I have mentioned so far are important. But the key issue is the will of the Indian technology buyer. There is, as I have already said, considerable expertise in our country to deal effectively with the technical, commercial and contractual aspects of acquiring technology from foreign companies. I myself have had the opportunity to structure, negotiate and clinch several tens of such technology acquisition contracts in the electronic sector. Our companies need to tap the available expertise in the country. But the limiting factor determining the success or failure of the task of such technology acquisition is not the identification of the success of those skills or being able to draw on them. My experience over the last 25 years has been that ultimately the factor determining success or failure is the managerial will of the Indian company to negotiate and conclude a truly viable technology acquisition contract maximally in his favor. Without such will, the whole exercise is pointless. Such will is always important. However, it is particularly so now when under the liberalized economic and industrial policy, the role that government agencies have been playing for the last 35 years in using the regulatory regime of technology import prevailing at that time to strengthen the hands of our industrial companies and entrepreneurs vis-a-vis -vis foreign technology suppliers is no longer available. The onus of successfully executing a technology transaction now lies substantially with the technology acquiring Indian companies.